It's important. Of uh, October 2nd to order. Um, we'll call, we'll show you, have Jeffy and Tom and me, and here comes, and here Carla. comes Carla. And uh, that's what we have. Um, we have a public hearing. First reading of Ordinance 1802. So tonight we're bringing back Ordinance 1802. Well, actually, for the first time, you're seeing Ordinance 1802, but it, it is intended to supersede Ordinance 1801, which was brought back to you um, for adoption in early September. And this is just to commemorate the change in the fire service charges um, after the final writ of mandate was heard by the um, Santa Cruz County Court. So the fire service charges for a two-inch fire service are being changed from $18.93 down to $14 even. Um, and so that's the purpose of this ordinance is to adopt that change. And all of the attached, um, all of the attached amended schedules are the same as they were under ordinance 1801 except for the fire service schedule, schedule O. Mm -hmm. Okay, any questions? Any public comment on this? You. Open the public hearing. Move we close the public hearing. Second. Motion is set on the second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That's unanimous. All right. This doesn't seem very complicated. I'm going to move approval. I will second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, okay, we don't. Doesn't seem to be a roll call. Okay. And so that's adopted and unanimous. So, yeah, so it's going to be brought back. Yeah, for, for a, a second note. reading. Yes. Yep. Okay. All right. We have another public hearing, 2.2, .2, request for variance from leak adjustment policy. So tonight we have a request from one of our customers, Robert McCormick, at um, 227 Treasure Island Drive in Aptos. And um, Mr. McCormick had a leak in June and July. And um, the, the leak covered two consecutive billing periods and he was offered an adjustment for those two billing periods. And Mr. McCormick would like a larger adjustment on the grounds that he believes that um, we should have shut his water off when we were at the property on, um, in, on when reading his June bill. Now the reason we didn't shut the water off at that time is because um, internally we have a procedure where a uh, customer service field crew go out and if they identify that the leak is a small leak, which is like a half a gallon a minute or less, then they don't shut service off because a variety of reasons. One of the reasons is it can cause plumbing issues if somebody's got a booster pump somewhere on the property. Another reason is sometimes we have customers who have medical needs and have medical equipment running, so disrupting their, their water service um, can cause more harm than not, so we typically don't shut them off in instances of small leaks like this. In Mr. McCormick's uh, circumstances, he actually was not home during the period of the leak. He was hospitalized, and so he did not get the notification until about seven days later. I'll just make the note that <clears throat> it, we're, often when you're out in the field, you're not even sure it's a leak. It, it, you know, it has a, that appearance, but there's not absolute proof at the time, so there's even a question when you're out in the field. Any questions of staff? Open the public hearing. Anyone wish to address us on this item? Move we close the public hearing. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That's unanimous. It just seems obvious to me we should deny this particular variance based on the, everything I've read. So I'll make that motion. Okay, I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That's unanimous. Okay, so we're done with public hearings. Now we go on to the consent agenda. There are just two things there. Anyone wish to pull anything? Anyone in the audience wish to pull any of these? I would just like to state that the uh, 3.2, the final report, has some um, 
some things missing and some things that are wrong in it. That uh, there was if, a few little yes. things. I just didn't think it was worth. Right. <laughs> For example, there are no indications of what illustrations are. There's no title underneath them that says this is illustration one, two, or three, even though the text refers to them. So if we ever use this for something, we probably want to fix right. those. Okay. I'll make well, I'll move approval of the consent agenda. Okay, I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right, this is the time for oral communication. So anyone who wishes to address us on any item not on tonight's agenda. Those items not on the agenda, not am I? Hi. Hello. Oh, my name is Randa Salak. I'm a customer of your district. And we, your customers, want to know if Soquel Creek is ready to take the water that Santa Cruz City is ready to give on November 1st or thereabouts. Two questions. I know you're not allowed to talk to me during this, but you could nod or, you know. <laughs> One, did you get the permit from the state of California to take the water from Santa Cruz? That's the first question. And the second one is, do you have your monitoring program in place so that you can see the effects of this pilot of transferring water? Two simple questions. Maybe, hopefully, yes. Water for Santa Cruz County went over the figures. Loch Lomond is now at 90%, which is 15% over what they estimated in their April water plan. That's great news, which means that there's an extra 450 million gallons in surplus water sitting in Loch Lomond. Santa Cruz City said at the Water Commission meeting last night that they're ready to send the water on November 1st or close to it. We want to know if you're ready to take it. Customers are watching. So maybe somewhere you can include the answers to that. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Wireless microwave radiation endangers the public and wildlife. And I don't recall if I gave you copies of this uh, health impacts. How dangerous is non-ionizing radiation? This was an interview in August with Dr. Martin Paul. And I understand he's the author of the 5G appeal of scientists and medical officials calling for a moratorium or a halt of the rollout on this 5G technology and uh, infrastructure, which is um, taking over the public right of way everywhere. And some of the effects, um, just to read you a little bit of this 5G, um, over 230 scientists from more than 40 countries uh, have concerns regarding the ubiquitous and increasing exposure to radio frequency microwave radiation generated by electric fields, wireless devices, already before the additional 5G rollout. And you have been provided data repeatedly over a number of years of the uh, harmful biological effects. They refer to the fact that numerous recent scientific publications have shown that EMF affects living organisms at levels well below most international and national guidelines. Effects include increased cancer risk, cellular stress, increase in harmful free radicals, genetic damage, structure and functional changes of the reproductive system, learning and memory deficits, neurological disorders and negative impacts in general well-being in humans. Damage goes well beyond the human race as there is growing evidence of harmful effects to both plants and animals. So knowing that this is harmful, 
you as responsible elected officials on the Soquel Creek Water District Board should be doing everything to see that you are not harming the public with these wireless devices. Popularity has no relationship to proof of safety or proof that something's help, helpful. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Thank you. did I give Your you time? this last time? I've got a couple of these I'll pass out. Time's up. Thank that. you. Plus Martin, uh, one page. Your time's up, I'm sorry. Of Martin Paul's work. That's it. Here you go. I only have four of those. Thank you. Anyone else wish to address us? Seeing no one, um, any director comments? Uh, I just want to bring up something up for a future agenda. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And that is, I w one of the things when I came in, first was elected four years ago to this, uh, this post, I was amazed at the workload necessary to prepare for these meetings. And they happened every two weeks. And then at a, I was at an aqua meeting and the Scotts Valley, a Scotts Valley manager was sitting next to me. He said, you were the Soquel Creek Water District. How do you do all the, the work just getting ready for meetings? So I'm raising the issue in oral communication because it hasn't ever really been on the agenda to, for this, to, direct, to discuss it as a future item on the, uh, in the meeting and uh, possibly to direct staff to analyze the workload and how they could maybe pace meetings farther apart or take more months that off, you know, where we only have one meeting at a time, so that there'd be more of a, like a three-week hiatus between meetings or something like that. Just some way to, uh, I think our meetings have now become more efficient and we're more to the point than when I first came on board here. So it seems like we could, barring an emergency, we could Well, we'll bring that up. Meetings. We'll put that on the agenda and discuss okay. it. Okay, that's, that's all we're requesting. Okay, so. anything else? Okay, so we're done with oral communications. We now go to reports. Item 5.1, the board planning calendar. Yes, two items. Um, on <laughs> Tuesday, October the 9th, there'll be two standing committee meetings. We will uh, have the public outreach standing committee from 10.30 to 11.30, and then the water resource management and infrastructure standing committees from four to five. Even though the two primary directors will be out of town uh, for that board meeting, the alternate uh, director Christensen will be there, so we will have the meeting. Um, we think it's important to keep the continuity, and especially since there's some newer uh, members of the public that are on that committee, we, wanna, we have things we can uh, get them up to speed on. Okay. Any questions? Uh, on the calendar, I just I wanted to mention again because I think I wasn't sure Carla was here last time when I was mentioning that I won't be available for the um, November 15th um, Mid County Groundwater Agency meeting. So I just wanted to see if backup was available. Yes, yes, <laughs> so far. I know it's good to get, it is good to get ahead of time. But it's, it's, it's the East Coast reception for my son's wedding. <laughs> so I got to go. have to cancel that. <laughs> nope. Not going to cancel that. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just mention <clears throat> one more thing, if I may. Um, right now, we have the uh, December meeting, I think, as, as potentially being canceled. We're having to, to look at that just because there's a lot stacking up on the second um, meeting. So... Uh, is it listed there, December? No, we don't December. have December. Just November. Oh, we don't have December. So, mm -hmm. okay, I thought that would, had already been out there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Item 5.2, water loss audit. Lots of good work. Yeah. Good evening. I'm pleased to bring you the 2017 water loss audit. Our audit is shown, excuse me, pages 68 69 through 71 are the um, attachments and I wanted to start with the water balance which is the core of the water audit and that's a breakdown showing 
the water losses as you move from left to right from the system input to um, a breakdown on the far right side, revenue versus non-revenue water. Our um, numbers in comparison to last year, we've had now had two validated water audits, um, the 2016 calendar year and the 2017 calendar year. And on page 65 of the packet, you'll see how our performance indicators measure up to um, the water loss technical assistance program audits that passed um, high level filter criteria to remove any audits that can, um, may have contained errors. Um, unfortunately, last year's audit, because we had an ILI infrastructure leakage index below one, which is the technical minimum, our audit was not part of that, su that subset of the um, water loss technical assistance program in 2016. But this year, the district's water loss audit in 2017, um, we got just right at the technical minimum with our infrastructure leakage index. So we are gonna be counted in that pool if they do a comparison of water audits for 20 2017. Um, for the most part, it was very similar to last year's audit and our recommended areas of improvement are the same volume, um, the volume from our own sources, customer metering inaccuracies, and build metered consumption. Um, that's about it. It's, do you have any questions? Questions? What's the difference between build metered consumption and customer, con uh, isn't that all just the customer meters? And so, let me sure I understand your question. Build metered consumption would be all of the, yeah, customer meters, um, as opposed to unbilled metered consumption, which would be yeah. like the polo grounds or our own internal usage. So it's build, but I mean, excuse me, it's metered but not build. Oh, um, so metered means not build then. No, no, no. You can have there's basically four categories. You can have build metered, build unmetered, mm -hmm. which we don't do any of that. And then you can have unbilled, metered, and unbilled, unmetered. So there's, um, if you look at the water balance on page 68, on the far right, you'll see those four categories. Um, obviously the build metered and the build unmetered are revenue water, and then the anything that's unbilled um, even if it's metered or unmetered, if it's unbilled, it goes into the non-revenue category. Okay. So I guess I get it now. So, um, so what effect do you consider the uh, catastrophic main breaks that happened? How how much have they contributed to this? So, if uh, they did contribute, um, 2017 we had quite a few main breaks, and you'll see the. Um, Attachment four shows you the water losses in green. Um, I don't know if it's printed in green. Um, so last year we had, there you can have water losses are, they're combined with apparent losses or real losses. The real losses are like the main breaks, the service leaks. So um, we had an increase <laughs> of our real losses, but we also, we also think that you know a lot of um, water loss um, control has to do with pressure management, and so because our pumps are running more frequently, they're cycling on a lot more, um, that can kind of cause pressure spikes in the system. So I think that contributed to the increase in the the water loss on the real loss side as opposed to the apparent losses. Because. Um, how does the, how does this now fit in with the? I know we were down a little bit, you know, the percentage is down. But um, I heard the one time when Christine presented the report that it was eight eight to ten was considered the industry standard. So is this significant that it's increased a little bit? Um, so eight to ten percent. Um, System water loss. losses yeah. uh, as a percentage of the production. Oh, production. Um, that is, they can vary pretty wi wi widely, but that is 
generally our range. Um, last year, I think we were 8.9%. This year, I think we're 9.9%. Um, and as Carla might be able to explain, the industry has gotten away from using percentages, so that's why we didn't include them here. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the trend in the water, real water losses does seem to mimic the trend in the production. So as Carla was saying... Um, oh, so the more you produce, the more you... Yeah, because the pumps are on more often, and so the pressure is higher in the distribution system. So that's a, a theory on why that might occur. Um, and the the uh, amount of known losses per main breaks, if if you see that our uh, our water loss was totaled 106 million gallons last year, um, our actual known losses are a, a, a tiny percentage of that, maybe somewhere around 6 million, something yeah, like that. Totally so million. everything else is unknown leaks. Um, like from? From the distribution system, from, you know, slow leaks uh, on fittings, the service line leaks, main leaks. Um, they could be slow, they could be leaks that don't surface. Um, so we do do acoustical leak detection when we have free time and uh, we kind of slowly move around the distribution system, but since I've been in this position, we haven't really found any significant leaks with that. So, good. yeah. <laughs> I know it's good to stay on the ball because I, you know, it, regularly at uh, Aqua meetings, they someone presents a paper on, the, you know, that as a possible new water source is actually reducing the leak level in your system, your water system. And so I just, it's hard to. Yeah, you can't just even see where the leak is. It's hard to have control over that. Right, and because we're at the at the low end of the infrastructure leakage index, which is that mm -hmm. ILI that I mentioned, the mm -hmm. what they consider the, you know the denominator of that is the you know unavoidable real losses as opposed to your current real losses. So if you if you are at um, that technical minimum, it means that you're you're basically not losing any more than what's unavoidable, <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, no, I so, and, and we did perform fairly well um, across the board on our performance indicators as, you know, apparent losses in, you know, and real losses in gallons per service connection per day. Those are, um, you know, th they take into consideration how many service connections and then they, they so our 2.15 gallons um, as opposed to 8.6 gallons across the, the state. So, we, you know, we are the, on the low side. And, and that's not to say that every connection is leaking, you know, 2.15 gallons per day, but that's kind of like um, just a number, kind of like per gallons per capita per day of consumption, you know, and not everybody's using 50 gallons or 55, but, you know, somebody might be using 100 and somebody's using 25. So it's not that every service connection is leaking that much. It's just across the board a metric. And then, um, you know, we we are also and the real losses in um, gallons per service connection per day per, you know, pounds per square inch. So the pressure we're also on the um, about half of what the um, the rest of the state was compared comparatively. So no potential savings there. In other words, no. I mean, we no. There's always potential savings that we're looking for for you know cutting back on water loss no, but I mean it's uh, I was just thinking almost out loud about whether the eventual repair and replacement of the ailing water mains that we have whether that would make an appreciable difference but it's we're actually pretty lucky it sounds like and what we've had happen here yeah thank you or it's not luck it's just the staff has been working hard at this <laughs> for a long time oh, you know everybody's working full 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 time but you know it's mm. it's still just sometimes it's a matter of luck but it doesn't happen in the middle of the night all the time <laughs> and uh any public comment on this uh, at the uh I didn't explain the data validity grade very well or at all. Um, so the the data validity excuse me the data validity grade is based on 
data validity, data validity inputs that we put on each um, of our um, volumes that we input into the software. So if we know that, um, and they're not all weighted the same. So a data validity um, grade on um, water produced show it holds a lot more weight than maybe um, oh let's say systematic data handling errors. So even though we do really well in our billing and software systems about handling all of our um, you know billing and getting all everything paid for and um, things that are kind of like the apparent losses, we may not. Um, be up to par on what the state thinks that we can do as far as like water pr like production meters and things that that score more heavily so because we got a 60 um it's not to say that we're getting a d or you know 60 percent it's just that um basically shows that there's room for improvement and we're not quite there yet with all of the we can't put a um the data validity inputs are one through ten and we can't put um, a 10 on something if we're only certain about our input and so we give it a five or a six or a seven. Um, so that's, that's how that kind of breaks down. Comparatively with the rest of um, the state, um, we're doing pretty good. We're right on target and they don't, when we did the water loss technical assistance program, when we went through their training, they they, they don't expect anybody to really be above, let's say like a 70 or a 75. I mean, it's kind of un, almost unlikely that you would be, you know, 80, 90 on a data, data validity score. So I hope that answers your question. Are there any one or two things that would get us higher on that score? Yes, there are, and those are listed on the um, improvement steps. Okay. Um, volume from own, from our own sources and we kind of we ran through about how yep. that's difficult because we're you need a long stretch I yes mm -hmm. exactly yeah, so okay thank you any other public comment seeing none I think this is just an informational item so yeah. there is no item 6.1 we go to 6.2 which is generating offsets for the water demand offset program with AMI yeah, and before Shelley launches into this, I just want to make a differentiation because these two items are so close. The uh, leakage that you just, the report that you just heard is anything before the customer meter, correct? So anything in our system and, and with AMI, what uh, Shelley, the type of leakage you're talking about is anything after the customer meter. So they're two separate uh, leakage categories. All right, Alyssa and I are going to be making a presentation on item 6.2, so let me switch it over, kick this off. Um, this item's a follow-up to our initial proposal that we made um, at the August 21st board meeting um, where we requested the board consider approving automated metering infrastructure, or AMI, as an offset generating project under our WDO program, or Water Demand Offset Program. Um, based on the estimated water savings expected from the project. Um, I want to acknowledge tonight that we do have some members of our customer service field crew here. We have Chris Friels, Joe Antos, and Jacob Arnold. Um, they collect our monthly meter reads, maintain our system, and work with the customers on a daily basis in regards to leaks, um, high water use, and other customer service issues. So. Their input uh, went into our water savings estimates here, and it really helped it helped us bring home some of the more general information to be more applicable to our particular service area and situation. So, thanks you guys for coming tonight and for your input. Um, we initially covered a lot of background on our WDO program at that last meeting and the AMI technology itself. So tonight we're going to try and keep it simple and just give a little bit of an overview about the purpose of the WDO program and how we think that AMI um, achieves the goals of the program. So 
Uh, this slide um, is shown in red on the map on the left. Our groundwater basin is impacted by seawater intrusion all along the length of our coastline and the coastline um, below our service area. Um, and that intrusion is a result of historical pumping by us and other users of the basin in excess of what, um, what natural recharge we get through rainfall. If seawater reaches our production wells, they become unusable. And so we have a multifaceted community water plan um, with uh, different actions to prevent this from happening. Um, including conservation, and within conservation, we have the WDO program. Uh, the purpose of the program is to prevent new development and the associated increases in water demand that you would typically see when somebody comes onto our system from exacerbating this intrusion. Um, as shown in the program, WDO program signage on the right, new development must offset two times the amount of water that they are expected to use. Um, as a result of that 2.0 multiplier, our program goes beyond being a water neutral development program and actually achieves a reduction in overall water demand. Um, development project applicants meet their offset by funding conservation or supply projects that the district implements. Um, and that brings us really to the heart of tonight's item which is to propose an upgrade to AMI as an offset generating project, generate water savings and offset credits that would in turn be sold to development project applicants. Okay, so um, at the August meeting, um, we heard that you needed more information on how AMI meets the WDO program and the board's selection criteria for offset generating projects before you were able to decide whether to approve AMI um, as a project. And so tonight we're gonna be demonstrating that in more detail, could you bring in that first one, um, by showing you how it, how it does that. Um, secondly, we heard that you needed more data and studies on the water savings potential of AMI, and Alyssa's gonna go into um, detail on that. And uh, we also, um, uh, are requesting tonight, if AMI is approved, we're asking you to consider pausing new water service applications for a few months, and we'll give a little bit of basis about why we're asking for that later tonight. So in addition to those requests, we are also providing information on uh, a tentative implementation plan for AMI as, you, as requested last time around and potential changes to the offset program administration to best accommodate a return to selling offset credits. So the key findings, um, just to put everything in perspective because there's a lot of information here, um, we feel that uh, the first finding, um, the AMI project meets the board's selection criteria for offset generating projects. Um, based on the data, studies, and input from our staff, uh, we feel confident that AMI can easily save 5% due to the leak detection, early leak detection and notification alone. And there's some other things that can add to that um, as well. And lastly, um, if AMI is approved, uh, changes to the WDO program uh, will be needed. So let's get to the basis for our findings, and I want to start with the adherence of AMI to the selection criteria for offset generating projects. Um, there were uh, fewer questions and discussions last time about four of the criteria, and so we're not going to touch on them a lot, um, but I did just want to run through them quickly, starting with cost. The cost of credits from an AMI upgrade is under our current um, offset price of $55,000 per acre foot, so it meets that cost threshold, doesn't require supplementation from the district, and the cost estimates are really right in that same ballpark of 55K per acre foot. Measurability, AMI provides high measurability due to metered water use. 
Um, the avail availability of consumption data, really down to the hourly level, and the leak notification capabilities of AMI. Um, benefits to customers, I don't think we need to go into that too much. There's a lot of benefits of AMI that we've, we've shown um, in the past. And the last one being permanence, can we count on the water savings from the project every year for 20 years or prorate it uh, based on an estimated lifetime of the project. And in this case, we have prorated the savings. Um, we'll get to that in a minute. Where there was a, uh, uncertainty at the last meeting was in regards to the additionality criteria. And additionality means, is the project something um, that the district would have done anyways in the next 20 years? Um, due to just process changes, uh, regulatory requirements, um, or other reasons. And if not, then the project meets the criteria. And so in the next slide, we, we're gonna address how it meets this criteria. So, um, while well, AMI was something that was on our radar to do eventually, this chart shows, as in the upper green bar, that it wasn't something we were considering for about another 10 years or so. Uh, so that puts us at around 2028 or 2029. That coincided with when we expected to have to replace the majority of our meters. And so we weren't, it wasn't even on our radar until 10 years out. Um, if we implemented AMI in 10 years, Transitioning to it 10 years earlier, meaning right now, would still result in 10 years of additional water savings in the years zero to 10. Um, in this case, um, as shown in the upper bar, in the orange, water saved in years 10 through 20 would not be considered additional. And as a result, uh, we've prorated the water savings of 172 acre feet per year um, by half to meet the additionality criteria. So we've made that adjustment and we think that that adheres to uh, the criteria. So what we're asking for tonight is the board to approve 86 acre feet per year of offset credit. And Alyssa's gonna now give uh, details and background on how we arrived at that number. Thanks, Shelley. So uh, real briefly before I start, I just wanna touch on some differences between our current AMR system and our proposed AMI system. With the current system, monthly consumption is read once a month um, when a member of our field crew drives by it with a receiver. So this means that we're only able to detect leaks or any other unusual um, high usage or unusual um, usage at all on the meter once a month. So um, we could have a leak going for 30 days or a leak going for one day. Um, and the customer has no way of knowing during that time. So with AMI, consumption is communicated automatically to the district several times per day. This means we have much more granular data. We have hourly versus monthly and can detect leaks as they happen and inform customers much earlier of any issues. And customers will also have access to, custom, to a customer portal where they can track their usage and set personalized alerts. With the new tools provided to us from AMI, we see three big areas of savings. The most obvious and probably most impactful is in leak detection, but we also think we would see reductions in incidents of high usage that are not considered leaks, and water savings associated with a more engaged, connected, and informed customer. And as I was Mentioning, we think that faster leak detection with AMI can result in significant water savings for the district and is a great benefit to customers. And so to get a realistic idea of just how much we can save, we first looked at some comprehensive uh, industry-recognized studies, such as the residential end-use study, which uh, we've used that study before um, for toilet data, and the California efficiency study 
And these looked at a huge range of leaks, from leaks below 50 gallons per day, which are quite small, to um, huge leaks from burst pipes. These studies estimate around 12 to 18 percent of water use is attributable to leaks. This information was further complemented by data on leak frequency that we collected from San Jose Water Company and the Environmental Protection Agency. But we realized that the scope of these leak studies may be a little bit broad and may be capturing leaks which are not easily detected or are quite small. So we looked at some more specific studies um, and narrowed down our estimate to look at leaks that are a little bit larger, generally greater than seven and a half gallons per hour. For reference, the smallest leaks we can detect are somewhere around three to four gallons per hour. The goal of this more targeted analysis it was to identify how much water is lost to leaks that we can consider kind of our low-hanging fruit. So this is larger leaks that are most um, reliably detected and which, if addressed quickly, could provide the biggest savings. From our research, we can see that those leaks contribute around 6 to 10 percent of demand. Yeah, and if we may pause for a second, Shelley, if you can shift the uh, screens. The data that Alyssa is just referring to is summarized in attachment three, and I think it's just important to show it. I just wanted to take a moment. So uh, on this page, studies, the, you know, kind of the summary conclusions, and then AMI pilots goes on to the next page. Then we have another page, summary information here of studies reviewed, and then it continues on. So I just wanted to make sure it was clear that that data is included in the uh, report. Thank you. Yeah, and kind of the, the whole point of us collecting all of this information is that we really wanted to take it and find the things that we felt were most relevant to us and um, so that we could really make an informed decision that way. Um, but getting back to this, from this 6 to 10 percent estimate, uh, we whittled it down even further to um, by multiplying an estimate of demand used by these larger leaks, um, in this case we used 7 percent to align with the Sacramento AMI study that we included as attachment 2. And we multiplied that by an expected percentage reduction in leak duration and ended up with an estimate of um, just over 5 percent. And so getting back to this, um, we estimate that faster leak detection can save us 5 percent of demand. However, this is only part of the equation. We also expect that we'll see some savings from decreased high use incidents, which are not considered leaks. Some situations that may result in high usage include um, intermittent leaks, uh, irrigation systems, which are set incorrectly and are going off all the time. Uh, we see that quite a bit, um, or a hose being left on. We have approximately 800 incidents of high usage a year, and those can waste considerable amounts of water, just as leaks do. And more frequent leak detection and the ability to break down um, the usage by hour should really help customers and the district to identify and correct those situations more quickly. We also think that increased customer engagement especially through the customer portal, will lead to savings by educating customers about their water use. When customers have more information, they're able to see where their water is going and are able to make better decisions about how they want to use water in the future. Uh, we think that an additional 5% savings from these categories is realistic and maybe conservative. However, um, in lieu of more studies, and better data on the subject. We're choosing not to recognize these savings um, for this estimate and are including those as kind of a soft savings. So in summary, even though we think that we may realize higher savings, we're proposing a water savings achievable by AMI as 5% of demand. This expected savings is uh, quite a bit more conservative than other agencies' estimates which are included in, F in uh, attachment three, and only consider savings from the leaks that we feel most confident we can reduce using the new technology. 
a 5% demand reduction is equal to 172 acre feet per year, which we then prorated to account for additionality, as Shelley mentioned earlier, to result in a final offset credit of 86 acre feet. We feel that with the proration, granting offset credit for 86 acre feet is faithful to the board selection criteria and that all in all the conservative approach staff and the board have taken assures that the AMI project ultimately meets the WDO program goal of protecting the aquifer. So now I'll pass it back to Shelley. Okay, that's a lot of information. Um, so we've discussed additionality and how AMI um, adheres to those criteria and the, how the water savings estimate of 5% was derived. Um, the board also expressed interest at the last meeting in knowing about the proposed implementation or rollout of AMI and any changes needed to the WDO program before you wanted to uh, make a decision on the water savings. So the next couple of slides cover those issues, um, starting with the implementation plan. We envision a two-year rollout with two phases. Phase one to include installing AMI and about 3,000 services in the middle of our service area there, which is represented in the map, and the red circle kind of uh, highlights that area, that general area. Um, major components of phase one are listed and they're also included in more detail in the memo. Um, once phase one's complete, we envision a, a full rollout, district-wide rollout, or phase two. Um, let's see, moving on to proposed key changes to the WDO program administration itself. Um, to accommodate a return to selling offset credits, changes are needed to our new water service process. Identifying um, the pathways for applicants that are already under uh, a couple versions of our WDO program, the old program, which was in place from uh, roughly to 2013 to 2016, um, and then the current program, which took off in 2016 and, and uh, we're operating under right now. And we also want to establish a transition plan and schedule for closing the current program and opening a brand new program where credits can be sold on a first come first serve basis um, with some, uh, some limitations. Our key proposed changes, again, are returning to a two-step will serve process, so a conditional board approval and an unconditional approval. Um, that's the same general process that's been in place for the majority of the program's lifetime and it really does work well when we have offset credits available for sale. Uh, we are also proposing a 10 acre foot limit on the purchase of offset credits from the district's bank to ensure that all development project applicants have an opportunity to purchase credits. So anybody that needed more than 10 acre feet for their project would need to go out and perform their own conservation or supply project with board approval. Um, other changes are identified in attachment for the memo, and we can uh, certainly take a look at those if, if you want more information. Um, let's see here, the attachment for also includes a figure which details how we would handle the existing applicants that are in the old and the current programs and how we would transition to a new program. In regard to getting approval for potential administrative changes, we're looking for some feedback tonight on whether you want us to bring those changes back um, at a subsequent board meeting or if you prefer that we schedule a special public workshop um, so that uh, we can uh, take a closer look at some of those things. Until we can uh, get approval for any program administration changes and to best serve the people that are already, um, have already applied and are in the process, as well as update program materials um, on the web and written materials and consult with land use agencies about any changes, 
We're asking for a temporary pause in accepting new water service applications. Uh, we want to make sure that we, when we roll this out as a return to selling credits, that we do it right and um, everything goes smoothly. So uh, it's approximately three months of pausing that we're, we're looking for. So that concludes tonight's presentation and the board actions are, are shown here um, and in the memo for your consideration and we'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Questions of staff? Not right now. I'm okay for now. I have one question right off. Go ahead. I, I, that was just the, uh, do you, have you, have we paused the uh, building, uh, the, uh, well, sir, <laughs> might escape me. Just the, the the unconditional and conditional permits. Have we ever suspended those in the past? We haven't closed the program temporarily temporarily to new applicants. But there was a period of time in 2016 when the shortfall was imminent and the offset credit bank that uh, we were still bringing projects, and the board said we're putting all of these on hold. We were still letting people apply, and they were theoretically getting added to the wait list at that time, but um, we didn't close the doors to accepting applications. So this is and different. This is different, and um, you know, I think it, it provides a cleaner transition to a new program if you close the doors and just say, you know, we're, we're working on all the details. We don't know what it's gonna look like quite yet, um, and you know we need to hammer those things out before we start providing people information. So I think it's a cleaner approach and it's more transparent and uh, understandable to the applicant. So would uh, the 86 acre foot of credit would that what would that do to the current list wait list? So um, attachment I think it's attachment two one or. Attachment one um, lays out, yeah, actually got the memo here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I know it was in the packet, but oh, I sorry. thought it'd be good to, there we go. Yeah. Um, the actual offset shortfall right now is 5.36 acre feet of water, roughly five acre feet of water. And that's from people under the old program that have already paid for their offsets and people under the current program where half of their offset went towards this long-term conservation project. Mm -hmm. um, we still are looking at, um, an additional nine acre feet maximum needed for 16 projects under the old program. Um, and then under the wait list, we have, let's see here, is it 35, 35 acre feet of water that those projects on the wait list would need. Um, however, that's a maximum and it's probably high by about 10 to 15 acre feet because we do have one large project right now that is in process for doing their own fixture retrofits and that's like a nine acre foot and then we have some others that are doing the same. So, um, you know, I think at the end of the day, we're looking at needing about probably 30-ish acre feet for the people that are already in process, whether they're under the old program or the new program. And so that leaves, you know, once we get those 30 people through, then if 86 acre feet was approved, we'd have 56 left to, to sell. And uh, returning to the two-step will serve process, um, people applying under a new program would not buy those until they actually go through 
their planning process and either get a tentative map for a bigger project or a building permit for a smaller project and then they'd come back and purchase those so new program applicants would probably be a year out before they started actually purchasing the credits if that makes sense any other questions just two quick ones okay so the pausing of the program is primarily because um, it would slow down the new program because it would take staff time that's part can. of it um, you know right now we we need to work on what are those changes look like if you approve AMI and so you know either coming back at subsequent board meetings or a, having a workshop um, would take you know some well, that, staff time yeah, to I'm, put I'm, that together I totally support the workshop but the question I have is pausing uh -huh. the applications what's the advantage of that um, it you want to go ahead yeah I mean from an applicant perspective when they are applying during this weird transitionary period um, they're very confused and so we think that just pausing it until we really have our feet under us is it's not only beneficial for us but ultimately it's gonna be a lot more beneficial for those applicants yeah I'll, I'll say you know we struggle with that a little bit and we consulted legal counsel so that this in no shape form or way looks like a moratorium or anything like that and it's not that you know there is a big light at the end of the tunnel what we're asking is give staff just you know so these people aren't going what's going to happen at the end the end there will be credits available to purchase we just need the process clean to serve the current customers and the f potential future new ones so yeah. and then the other other question is a simpler one the um, customer portal that's phase one and are you confident that you can get that going fairly <laughs> quickly so in that's phase one we would we would get the AMI infrastructure in fine-tune the operation of that and our internal processes and then we would roll out the portal to those customers in phase one and so get that all squared away while then we're moving to phase two. So it'll be the end of phase it'll one. It'll be the end of phase one. So something like a year from when it starts? Um, yeah, probably. It's probably looking at about a year. Okay. Maybe a little less. It's 3,000 services and, uh, you know, it's about a fifth of our service area. So open to get that done as quickly as possible okay public anyone in the public wish to address us on this item thank you good evening my name is Becky Steinbrunner I'm a resident of Aptos um, I'd like to hear your districts definition of uh, what would qualify for a water demand project that these monies could be used for Stop. all right um, <laughs> I I you can will make your comments and when you sit down we'll look to the board for okay to whether all to right respond. Thank well you. then I will repeat from your um, documents when you declared the uh, the system of having water demand offsets and taking money from people and using that money to do projects the the criteria for using that money was that it was to go to doing conservation projects that would not have been done otherwise let me repeat that that would not have been done otherwise your district has budgeted money for the AMI project already this is a new shift in using the WDO money to fund it and I am proposing to you again that funding the AMI project with your WDO money does not fit your own definition of what you can do with that money I also um, want to ask that you have looked into the information that Miss Nina Beatty drove here from Pacific Grove to present to you 
about the legalities of smart meter in this county. This county has had a lot of activism regarding smart meters and the county was responsive. So I wanna know that you've researched that thoroughly before you um, embark on this enlargement of smart meters. I would also like to see your district do a pilot project in an area where you have had the most leaks and really verify that your water savings is true. I don't think it's fair to include a large percentage of the 3,000 as the Aptos Village project, which is what is part of phase one, because that's all new construction. I think you really need to do a, a pilot project in an area that is problem prone and really get some good information that way. Um, again, I wanna voice my protest to having widespread um, EMF increase in a, an area that I have no control over as not one of your ratepayers. And again, to protest that you would consider using rate um, WDO money for this project. Thank you. Also Thanks noting up. you're doubling the application fee for those coming in. Anyone else? Marilyn Garrett, resident of Aptos, part of Wireless Radiation Alert Network. I um, concur with what Becky said. This sounds like a improper use of your finances. I often think of the book, Toxic Sludge is Good for You, Lies, Damn Lies, and the Public Relations Industry. And there's a quote in there by Burson Marsteller, one of the public relations firms selling products for companies. The role of our communication is to manage perceptions which motivates behaviors to create business results and I must commend you for the presentation of doing just that, managing perceptions to motivate behavior to create business results. The facts computer generated that you have presented, I find very questionable, but there are omitted data or omitted facts that are crucial in your presentation, like the elephant in the room, that you will be increasing mandatory exposure to radio frequency, microwave radiation, uh, that is known to be damaging, for instance, around uh, cell towers emitting radiation. Over 17 studies show consistently increased cancer incidence, people experiencing insomnia, memory loss, heart irregularities, fatigue, depressive tendencies, and the list goes on. Now, since you know of the dangers and you have been presented repeatedly with printed material and videos, this seems to me like intentional harm. The carbon footprint is huge on manufacturing all these products, transporting them, the uh, e-waste that you're not talking about. No consent form has been given to people that they uh, give their informed consent to increase radiation that the World Health Organization labels as a possible carcinogen. You have received the smart meter brochure from Stop Smart Meters. Fires have happened with these so-called smart meters. You have received copies of Dr. Pokey Namkung's report, the former county health officer on health risks associated with smart meters. Um, Time's up, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I'm opposed to this. I'll give you this half sheet that you should check out again. Thank you. This should not be passed. Anyone else? 
Seeing no one, I'll bring it back to the board. Well, can I just say, you know, thank you for coming back with all of what we asked for. You know, like thank you for organizing the studies and 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 adding the justification for additionality. Um, so thank you. Well, <coughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say that one. The re one of the reasons this came back to the board was because of the question of additionality. And that has been addressed satisfactorily to me anyway. I don't know I, mm -hmm. I don't know what to the, how the rest of the board feels about that, but that that idea of additionality is okay. I think you've adjusted for that. Um. So we have a number of motions that we can make. Right. Mm -hmm. I would actually like to make the motion number four with um, directing staff to schedule a public workshop on proposed changes to administration of the WDO program. Well, that, that doesn't make sense. We don't do the first one. So maybe yeah. we should. Well, we could, we could actually talk about administration before we approve the program. So if we, if we think that we need to have the administration, you know, all resolved before we approve the project, then th I think it does make sense. But that's just, I don't, I think this issue is complex enough that a, w a workshop would be, would be the, the correct forum for this. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we should be spending our time tonight on this. I agree. For that. I agree. So, do you have a date in mind or timeline for that? Well, um, We'd defer to what, something that works for the board. I mean, Probably be a. It may be one of the November, or the earlier November meeting. Uh, look a little lighter. Is that right? The sixth or the twentieth of, of November. So maybe we could schedule like a five p.m. start date on that. And if the board, uh, it's a double header, but kind of light agenda. I think that's probably okay. I don't think this is one that needs four hours or something like that. I really, yeah. you know, I, I think I'm, I'm, I think we're not that far off. Yeah. Well, maybe we should take them in order. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, back again. Well, let me make the motion. Motion number one, we approve the funding of the AMI upgrade with WDO funds. Okay. Oh. I'll second. Okay. And then I'd just like to ask one more question, though. But uh, also address some of Becky's comments on the uh, the funding, yeah. the original funding, and explain what happened with that. So the any almost any WDO project we've done, you look back at the toilets. We had to fund that, and then we recoup it in the back end uh, as the projects come in. So otherwise, we're waiting on development. We have to stop, get the money, and move forward. That just doesn't make sense. So you fund the, the district funds it and recoups those fund those, those uh, funds spent uh, to do that. So whether we would, you know, it it has to be funded through us, or that's the way we've done it in the past. The, all the toilets, the thousands of toilets, when we did direct direct install, we funded that. We sold the credits. I think more importantly, it's just that it's the timing. Like if we we were planning on doing it later, yeah. but this is accelerating it by ten years. And and so the, and the reason it's on the, that. and the reason it's on the budget is because of that potential decision. Yeah, because staff was thinking that this right. was going to happen and wasn't we something have to that was budgeted prior to that. Yes. Yeah. 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 In the additionality, the customer or the uh, Becky walked in late and missed that, but maybe she can go back and look at the. The video to catch that. So if we answer. didn't approve number one, I think we would not do the, the right. AMI program. We in fact would right. wait for ten it, years. It right. wouldn't be workable. That's yeah. right. Okay, so we have a motion. Yeah, to and the what for a WDO project to qualify, it has to save water. Right. Bottom line. Yeah. Whatever, and this. So by approving this meet, motion, you're meets, green. Meets it is additional. It is additional, and the five percent is an acceptable and savings. But measurable, measurable savings. Yeah. Yeah. 
although, yeah, we'll be able to tell whether it actually happened or not. I'm actually, uh, yeah, we can talk about the amount on the next one, but yeah. Okay. So there's a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 That's unanimous. Okay. So on the, the second one is the details, whether we approve the 5%. No, that's embedded in number two, the 5%. That's what he's saying. 2% yeah. is oh, embedded okay. in number okay. two. Yeah. So I, I still think fantastic effort to bring all these different studies forward. The Sacramento study, I did look up Sacramento, and their charge for a unit of water is a little bit over a dollar. So I, I don't think there's as much of an incentive there to define leaks. And, I th and the on their on their website, they still do have that there's unmetered services. So again, where the cost for water is uh, sixty-one dollars, um, I think it's I'm not even sure it's per month. But the but I think we've been conservative enough that the five percent will be there, especially if we roll out the customer portal, uh, portal, sorry. Um, so I'll, I'll make that a motion to prove it. So that's setting it at the 86? At the 5%? 5%, yeah. Okay. Well, the 86, or is it really the number, the number is the 86? Yeah. Um, yeah. At the 5%? I'll second that. At the 5%, right. 10 years. Okay, well, I'll second your motion. I just did. Oh, you, you did. did? Oh, okay, good. Any discussion? I'm good. All in favor? Aye. 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 And it's not unanimous. Two. I don't think we need to do three because we're doing four, I think. Yeah. Right. I'll, I'll make the motion for four to schedule a public workshop to pr okay. for proposed changes I'll to second. the WDO program. I'll second that. Any discussion? And we'll, with the the staff to do it probably in November, right? Yeah. Okay. Question of the agenda. No, no, Sorry. no. No public no comment right now. That was over. Okay. So uh, all in favor of that motion? Aye. 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 That's unanimous. Okay. Five is the pause motion. Yeah, I, I don't like pausing. I understand it's gonna it'll be confusing, knowing that this is coming out, but. Applicants have the, the discretion to just not submit an application until the, the new program is is rolled out, since it's going to going to be fairly soon. You don't think they can we conceivably could like regret the application if it if there are some changes that came up. Uh, we could address the pause at a workshop too. That is and keep it going until the workshop. Well, an advantage to not doing a pause is. By taking them as they come, you're getting them in order. I mean, if there's any need to have, you know, I'm first and you're second and someone else is third, mm -hmm. uh, this allows it to get. Otherwise, um, you know, people no, run in after it gets unpaused. The door, the door will open and yeah, be one day up. and people will try and oh, I'm ahead of you. And, hmm. I, I think. Well, I, I'm open to hearing more discussion on it. So I, I like your idea, Tom, of discussing it. Can we just go, keep it going until the workshop? Yeah. Well, yeah. we were, you can. Can I add um, a couple other points? So uh, the wait list, um, the people on the wait list uh, have a different agreement. They have a four-year will-serve approval. If their project doesn't go through, um, we give them back 90% of the offset fee because they're paying it up front. Um, we, uh, we're also proposing in the transition that the people on the wait list be given an opportunity to, if credits are available, just purchase the credits and because we would be doing away with the wait list. Yeah, I'd like and to discuss that And then all new workshop. people would go toward the new program, which is the two-step conditional unconditional. Mm -hmm. And that, um, that means that those new applicants wouldn't be purchasing their offset credits up front. They would be going through planning first. We would allocate the credits to their project so that we uh, have a good accounting of them and we don't end up in a shortfall again. Um, so 
I think just administratively, it would help to kind of close the current program right now um, so that I, I we just that. work with those applicants. I, un I understand that if, if, if I'm building a family home and I want to see whether I can get water and I've been told that, that the, the program is paused, that's a concern for me. Mm -hmm. so what that, we're saying that's my that's that's my yeah and, and we're saying that we'll resume taking applications on January 1st when we have more details about what the new program will look like and we can better communicate those requirements to the applicants um, so we're not we're not telling them not an indefinite Canada. pause yeah it's it's three I months I still would be concerned myself I mean you can take the applications and just tell them you know that we're rolling out a new program and you'll be in that program and more details will be forthcoming could we just make a, a so uh, yeah and stack them up. kind of the other the other point is that uh, we do get a lot of uh, inquiries about new services and those inquiries are an extensive uh, they take a lot of staff resources and I think if we leave it open and we're going to be getting bombarded because people are going to be trying to get in the door or they're worried about something and it's just going to detract from our ability to i think you know make the changes to the program roll it out uh, we're also would be working on ami implementation at the same time and so we're trying to you know be most efficient with our staff resources and this really you, gets us there saying hear what you're saying but the other directors might not feel the same way I, I I had a suggestion yeah yes you could pause until your November 6 meeting so that you don't have a rush to the door and you have a workshop where you spend some more time really discussing the differences between the programs That's a month away. I mean I mean I personally I'll just put my opinion I don't think pausing for until January 1st is going to be a big stress on people if they know there's really something there rather than it's not just saying oh there's a pause oh no I'll never get my house it's just like hey we're reorganizing it you know we'll you put you on the list to let you know as soon as we know what the program looks like ah oh, you're gonna make know. a list huh well I'm just saying we're taking well, their names then I mean if they there's I mean we don't have anything to tell them specifically what it'll That's look the whole like point. Yet. Mm -hmm. yeah I mean we we Till we have a specified a new program, the old program is in effect. Yeah, well, they just finished uh, a scheme that that created a lot of work. Also, just doing. And there's that. how many people on the waiting list? Forty. Forty-six. So. Yeah, I mean, I, here here's the dilemma. The if reality is they're not going to get anything happening if it, with the current program for a long, long time. Right. So the waiting till January for the new program just doesn't seem like a long wait. Yeah, maybe maybe another option is to take appointments uh, when we get the program. The, the, the con take take appointments so and and call those people up or email them when we get the uh, program in order. I mean, the whole thrust behind this is not to make people worry or anxious, and it's to you know serve them the best we can as quickly as we can. Um, we're concerned that if we get straddled with uh, trying to wrap up an old program, implement an AMI uh, program, and create a new WDO program, which you know is really hard to get it on the mark, that we're, we're going to do a poor job across it's the board. It's going to take you longer if you don't. Yeah, it's take us there's longer, no, and there's no doubt about that. Yeah, yeah. and then again, a pause is a red flag. Okay, and and I and I that's fine if you want to go that way. But the other the other kind of quandary is if they're under the old program, then they're going to really want to go to the new program when it comes in. Of course, we can talk about that at the workshop. Okay. So I, I'm okay with the pause myself, but we could wait and decide at the workshop if you want, and just keep it going till then. We don't. It's up to you if you if you think a pause is is necessary. <coughs> I won't vote for it, but you can yeah. make the motion. All right, I'll make a motion. Let's see what happens. <laughs> that we have this pause starting now. And then I don't know if it'll be officially January 1st, but no later than that. That then 
to when we can institute the new program. And I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No? No. Okay. We're not having oh. a workshop. We'll let you know when there's a workshop. Mm -hmm. We'll let the public know when there is a workshop. Yeah. Okay. What's on the agenda? Okay. So uh, I want to respond to some of the public comments. I mean, I, I guess people don't realize that we now have these automated meters almost in every one of our meters in the entire district. The only change is by going to AMI instead of sending out a signal every 11 seconds, five times a minute, is that we will do it, I guess, once an hour, something like that. Mm -hmm. So that's 300 times less signals. It's actually once every 12 hours for the consumption data, but it's hourly data that's sent. Okay. So it's um, only transmitting if there's a leak alert, a then it's sent as soon as the leak's detected. Okay, all right, so even more savings in the electricity. So you're basically uh, objecting to something that's gonna make things better. We currently have AMR, which goes every 11 seconds, in throughout the entire district. And we're not liable to say, let's just pull it all out. Um, because it does help to find leaks. And uh, so it's like about almost 8,000 times a day mm -hmm. versus two. That's, that's the difference. That's pretty good saving. So now you know. Transmission. You're, you're arguing against something that I think is a benefit. So you can continue doing that if you want. Okay. All right. So, so let's move on. So do we have? Did we we voted on a workshop, right? Yes. So and yeah. then we can talk about a pause after that. Yeah. Right. Okay. right. I, I think we should talk about it at the yeah. workshop. Yeah. 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 Okay. So 6.3, approvals to the district's leak policy. Thank you. Uh, we gotta get over to this one. Oh, sorry. Paying attention there. So item 6.3 is bringing back the district's uh, leak adjustment policy at the last board meeting on September 18th. Um, we pose some questions to the board to get some input on how that um, policy should be revised. And so tonight we're bringing back the revised policy. A lot of it remains consistent with our existing leak adjustment policy. The policy frequency will still be once every three years, but we did go ahead and memorialize a variance that was granted to a customer last year that if they do have two leaks within that three-year period that they can choose to take advantage of the higher of the two leaks and pay the, and pay for the, for the smaller leak. The other thing that's consistent with our existing leak adjustment policy is that the uh, adjustment will be available for two consecutive billing periods because often customers experience leaks that cross billing periods. So the changes to the tier adjustment policy or the leak adjustment policy would be to expand the scope um, to include any unintentional water use. That would be available once in a three year period. The um, other change is to update the tiers so that they're reflective consistent with ordinance 1802 that will be brought back for final consideration at the next board meeting. So those are the changes that are incorporated into this revised policy. Any questions of staff? Any public comment on this? Good evening, my name is Cherry Maurer and I appeared before your board back in August with an appeal on my water bill. And it was for unintentional water use. I indicated in a letter to your board that I had been in, out of the country during the time that a reported $908.22 bill was mailed to my residence, $847.74 of which was not explained. 
and I appealed to your board for some kind of solace or rate reduction, bill reduction, and your response, I believe, was to direct staff to relook at the leak adjustment policy to address unexplained water usage in addition to leakage. And I have looked at the re revised policy and tried to apply it to my situation, and I am somewhat befuddled. And I am wondering if staff might be able to walk me through how my particular circumstance would be affected by this revised policy. In particular, in looking at the example that's presented with the revised leak policy, there's an A through I mentioned as an example, and for the life of me, I cannot figure out G in that example. And so in trying to apply this formula to my particular circumstances, if I don't understand the components of the formula, I really am at a loss as to whether I feel personally in s I can support or not this revised policy. Well, we're not gonna do that tonight. But you can go in tomorrow and talk to staff, and they can talk you through it, as you asked. So please do that. I think, I expect it would probably apply to you, but the staff would probably have a better feeling for it. Yeah, go ahead and reach May out to me tomorrow. Chair. We started doing this after your uh, appeal. Right. So I understand that, sir. Thank you, and I, I appreciate that. Boy, I think it should apply, but. Right. It does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other public comment? Seeing none, we'll bring it back to the board. I'm assuming this will need to be adjusted with new rates, right? We will need to reconsider this once new rates are in place and if, and okay. if they are adopted in the spring. Okay. Thank you for coming back with this. Yeah. For the time being, I'm up for it. I'll make the motion. Okay. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That's unanimous. We go to 6.4. Receive written and oral public comments on the draft initial study. Give us just a minute while we do the shuffle. And let me talk about this item. This is, uh, this is a very special item. This is not the board doing this. This is uh, getting public comment to the preparers of this Right, we're just IS announcing negative, it. Negative, yes, the mitigated negative declaration. So if you come and talk to us, we're not going to respond in any way. Instead, that will be recorded by the uh, preparers. Okay, we got you up front. Okay. The initial study, ne negative, negative, negative declaration. So many acronyms. Yes. Hi, yes, thank you, Dr. Daniels, for pointing out that item 6.4 really is about public comments to be received tonight on the um, initial study mitigated negative deck that has been prepared for the pilot well efforts at the Twin Lakes Church site. Um, ESA, who is our consultant, has prepared an initial study and mitigated neck deck, and we have a couple of slides, and then I'm gonna turn it over to Elisa. Basically, we'd just like to give a quick overview on the project, uh, what is before you on this item tonight, give you a, a kind of a quick overview of the purpose of this pilot project, um, the overview of the project and describe what the components would be, and then of course your take comments. So as you know, our continued theme of uh, our efforts here as uh, the water district is to address the groundwater overdraft and seawater intrusion problems that we're facing. Um, this is uh, one of our maps that we've been using a lot lately to illustrate that um, to tie in the seawater intrusion issues that we have here in our Santa Cruz Mid-County area in the red, which was just recently confirmed with the SkyTem data, along and accompanying our monitoring sampling that's done. Um, below that is all of the seawater intrusion that is detected south of us in the Pajaro, Watsonville, Salinas, and Monterey area. So from the Pleasure Point area all the way down to Monterey, um, the Monterey Bay area is challenged with this. 
The Twin Lakes Church Pilot Recharge Well Project is a project that has been identified in our Prop 1 groundwater planning grant that we received and was awarded in January of this year. Really it is to better understand the characteristics of the recharge well that we're proposing in the area as part of the proposed Pure Water Soquel project. Specifically, this recharge well is designed to help us identify and better understand the recharge capacities that we've um, estimated and assumed in the groundwater model. We'd also like to understand and get a little bit better understanding on the geochemical characterization. Brown and Caldwell did do a study a couple years ago where they did take well cuttings from samples from <coughs> neighboring monitoring and production wells in the area, but this would give us core samples that we could better characterize so that we can plan for if purified water was to be put into the ground at this location, what kind of conditioning would we need to do for that water. So the project defined in this initial study and mitigated negative deck is a pilot recharge well that we would drill at the Twin Lakes Church site. This is one of the sites that we have identified in the Pure Water Soak Health Project. Um, the ISMND, which was released last month, and this is the document right here, um, outlines that the project is defined in this red bounded area here, which is kind of a, a more woody area next to a parking lot. It also has a field. There's the children's school and then a gymnasium. Well, Lisa, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me here again tonight. Um, scoot up a little closer. Um, thanks again for having me here tonight. Um, as Melanie mentioned, we've helped the district prepare the environmental documentation for the proposed project before it can move forward. Um, what we have done is prepare an initial study considering the, the describing the project and considering the environmental setting as well as the potential for impacts to occur during implementation of the project, including both its construction and the testing period. Um, and what we have found through that study is that there are not known sensitive resources uh, um, in, within the project area, but in the in in the absence of, of or in caution, we've pro we've uh, requested some mitigation measures be prepared or, or implemented for biological and cultural resources to um, ensure that uh, impacts to substantial impacts to those resources, any potential resources, are avoided. Um, other than that, we have not identified any other substantial potential for substantial impacts. Uh, and um, have, based on that assessment, prepared a um, mitigated negative declaration for the project. That negative declaration has been filed with the State Clearing House, and at the same time, a notice of availability of this draft uh, public document has been posted uh, at the project site, as well as an email um, notice notification has been sent out to adjacent properties and agencies and also um, the district has provided input to the press, created a calendar event and a dedicated page for the project on your website. With the filing of the, the ISMND, Mitigated Negative Declaration at the State Clearinghouse, we've begun a public review period that, that started on September 12th and will go through October 12th and during that time we were taking public comments um, from public and, and agency comments um, we are tonight taking oral and written comments and also will be continuing to take written comments through the end of the comment period at, f at 5 o'clock on October 12th. Um, the, the bottom of our, our slide here presents the locations that comments can be submitted to other than the oral comments that we'll take tonight. And um, if anyone is interested in, in getting close to that, we can provide that information. Um, I think with that, we will turn it over. Do we turn it over for questions first? Yeah, I think just to reiterate again that um, at this point, once, at least I think you're done, um, we do invite anybody in the public who does want to provide an oral comment to come up to the microphone, um, state your name. These comments are going into the CEQA process. This is not really comment to the board. There is no action uh, of the board tonight except to just have our consultant receive the comment. So if, is there anybody here in the public that would like to provide a comment? Hey, 
Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner, resident of Aptos. I found out about this in, a, in an article, a very good article written by Jessica York at the Santa Cruz Sentinel. I looked on your website for information and saw nothing. I looked again on the website and saw nothing. Now maybe it, it's there if I go digging somewhere, but it's not on the very first page that comes up when someone um, does a search for SoCalCreekWaterDistrict.org. It's not there. It's not in your what's on tap. So um, at least not the copy that I picked up today at your district office. So I think that there has been insufficient noticing of this process and I would like to ask that the comment period be extended 30 days and that um, um, having a sign at the site is, is uh, really quite invisible because <laughs> it's in the trees at a parking lot that you wouldn't see unless you go to the church or unless you're a student that parks there. But for the general public, it would not be seen. So I think that there needs to be better noticing and the comment period needs to be extended 30 days to allow for better re public review. Um, I did get a copy of the, um, the report here with your district packet and I do have some comments. Um, I want to make sure that the 14 inch pipe that would be the uh, part of the, uh, the well be capped uh, in the document, it looks like only the four inch pipes adjacent would be capped. And I'm concerned with, um, a, in essence, a portal 1,000 feet deep into the drinking water supply could be open to contamination and possible sabotage. I want to know the location of the temporary, am I only limited to three minutes here? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, I'd like to know the location of the 22,000 gallon tank. Um, I'd like to know if there's going to be a pump to pressurize the water at 500 gallon GPM. I'd like to know what private wells near the estates and New Brighton wells that will be the monitoring will uh, have, if those have been considered. And if those owners, if they are there, are being notified, I assume there will be some sort of a tracer chemical uh, put in this water to uh, check for um, water flow. And um, I want to know who's going to pay for the 6,480,000 gallons of water that's going to be used for this. Will that be uh, on the backs of the ratepayers? And I want to know how many oak trees are going to be removed. I see that one of the um, mitigations is regarding uh, bio and removal of trees, but it's not specified how many trees in their location and exactly what would be done with those trees. Thank you. I will try to submit written comment later. Thank you for my very limited time here. You can submit anything in writing to. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Okay. okay. Close Thank the public you. input. Yep. We'll move on. One thing I'd like to say is that th this has been mentioned as something for uh, pure water, but I would imagine if you were doing the city's proposed or thought about aquifer storage and retrieval, that this well could be used for that too. I would assume it's a proper environmental review and that of sort of thing is, mm -hmm. is conducted. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we move on. 6.5, approved scope of work for professional hydrology. So this item is a um, contract amendment for hydrometrics, which is now known as Montgomery. Um, as mentioned in the staff memo, we have we currently have several contracts with some consultants who are supporting the evaluation and feasibility that is underway for the Pure Water SoCal project. The tasks related to general hydrology were still being identified at that time when we were identifying those scopes. So today what is before you in item 6.5 are the tasks that we have associated with needing and uh, requesting some professional services from uh, Montgomery. 
those specifically um, include five main topics or tasks that um, are outlined and in the scope, which include the grant support. Um, Cameron and his team have been helping quite a bit as we go forward with applying for the Prop 1 implementation grant. And heavily at this point, we've been working on the Prop 1 um, planning grant activities, which has actually, I feel, increased in terms of some support. A lot of the questions that um, are being asked of us to for them to better understand the characteristics are coming from Cameron and his team. Also, uh, we've asked that they continue to help support us as we go forward with the environmental review process. Again, with the close of the public comment in August, our team is now going to begin reviewing the comments and helping ESA prepare the final EIR. The third item is the regulatory and permitting support as part of the Prop 1 planning grant activities. They have identified a technical advisory committee. We've asked that um, Cameron and um, as a representative from Montgomery sit on that. Um, number four is the phase two groundwater modeling. There were some modifications to the model that were done for the NGA that we've now included those efforts to be uh, redone so that it could be a part of our final EIR. And then of course the fifth one is general support and advisement. As we are going forward with this project, we are seeing that we may need some time to have um, Montgomery assist us on other tasks not to yet to be a defined. Um, and so we've asked that we have a little bit of extra funds that we would possibly need, and it, of course it would be a not to exceed amount, um, and if needed. Uh, one thing to note with the Montgomery task items is that um, all of their efforts that they are doing are in support of the Prop 1 planning grant activity, so 50% of it is coming f as a grant reimbursement. Any questions? Any public comment on this item? Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner, resident of Aptos. I just want to uh, point out again that your district is spending um, an additional almost $100,000 here for a project that you still say you haven't exactly chosen to do. So I want to point out the um, disingenuous <laughs> um, attitude that, that, that the district has regarding public and that you are very much committed to doing this project. I would like to see an equal amount of dollar and zeal toward a stormwater and hopefully with the new golf course owners, um, they will be agreeable to doing that. And to the um, the water transfers, I was at the um, Santa Cruz City Water Advisory Commission meeting last night and um, it looks like it's on track. I'm hoping you will keep that up and that you will accept the water come November 1st. The reservoir is at a, a very good level and it looks like that could go and I hope that you accept that water. Thank you. I would rather see that than this, really. Well, should I comment or not? Yeah. I'll pull it back to the board. I guess I just, you know, I, I think saying that it's not putting money into an environmental impact statement in support of that environmental work, that is very valid use of, of funds. To see that it's, in, you know, which is the most environmentally, you know, superior alternative, so that's all. Okay. I'll, I'll make the motion that we authorize the board president to carry on with this. Okay. I'll second. We have a motion and second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. That's unanimous. Okay, that's, we have no written communications and the next item is a closed session, so I wish to thank everyone who okay. came. <coughs>